constantly believe in yourself, believe in your product. If you feel like your product is, if you feel that you, your product has value, you'll have a lot of people that will dismiss it or say that's really cool, but you know, that's as far as it goes. And you'll have a lot of days where you're thinking, maybe this was a mistake, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And you'll have a lot of times where you're doubtful, but I would say just continue to keep the faith, keep holding on to your belief that you've come up with something uh, valuable and that just keep pushing forward and having faith, it'll work out. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com. We're always here to help. Now, today we have another great guest on the podcast, Joel Jacobson, and to give you a brief introduction to Joel. So he went to a Bonneville High School, for those of you that are, are listeners that are in Utah, um, grew up in a, in a single uh, parent home or single mom home, and she always worked to provide and provided a, a great example of, um, or of hard work. Um, originally, he didn't necessarily care for uh, school as much, didn't uh, like math and some of the other, or didn't do as well in math and some of the other classes, grades or so, so graduated, went to be a commercial plumber for a period of time, went on a religious mission to Brazil, came home and decided he didn't want to be a plumber for the rest of his life, um, and he wanted a bit of a, a different uh, a career path, and so really never thought about college until that point, but decided to go to college, went, uh, started out uh, at uh, Weber, went to U of U, went into some engineering, um, got one of his uh, professors, owned a consulting company, inspired him to go into that, got his professional license in engineering, went and worked at uh, Hill Air Force Base uh, on F-16s for a while, got some mentorship, got some licenses, started his own engineering firm, um, got some DOD scholarships, um, graduated, went and worked for another contractor on F-16s, Got, or did or continues his own engineering firm and worked on some of the products, including one that uh, we're happy to be helping with a bit on uh, on the patent side as well, which is a, a cool product that's a quick connect for um, AR-15s and for other products. So with that much as an introduction, and that's quite the journey, welcome on the podcast, Joel. Thanks, Devin. Dang. I guess we can conclude this one. <laughs> We'll just walk or leave on a high note. So that will be it. No. So I gave that 30,000 uh, 30, quick overview of kind of your journey, but take us back a bit. Uh, take us back if I can not get tongue tied. Take us back a bit in time and tell us kind of how your journey started. We're going to Bonneville High and uh, we'll, we'll chat from there. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So going to Bonneville High, you know, I was a, more of a jock, I guess you'd call me or a grunger back in the day. I didn't really care for school as much. And, um, didn't do well in math and I, you know, had some really close friends back then and we, we were a pretty tight knit group and, uh, but yeah, back then sports was pretty much my life. And so never saw myself ever <laughs> that I was going to be the owner of an engineering firm, you know, mm -hmm. in the future. And, you know, having graduated with advanced degrees in mechanical engineering and aeronautical engineering. So <laughs> It was so, you, so you went to Bonneville right. High, and then I, as I mentioned, part of the journey is you graduated, you know, got so-so grades, some classes like math, and other ones you didn't love or love and enjoy quite as much at that point in time. Now, what made you decide to go into commercial plumbing after you, after you graduated? Yeah, so after I graduated, uh, I had a cousin who worked for a plumbing company, you know, and he just said, hey, you graduated, you want a job? And I just thought, sure, low-hanging fruit. So I took the job, you know, worked full-time. Um, and was able to make some pretty good money and kind of just, I don't know, work full time and got mm. to see the labor side, the boots on the ground side of the workforce. So it was good, good for me. So, no, and I, I think that's, you know, it's, it's great to get those jobs where you learn a lot, get experience, learn what you like, what you don't like, and what you think of things and everything else. And so you, you did that, I, it sounds like for about a year or so, and then you went and reserved a religious mission in Brazil, which uh, is always a fun thing, you know, a, a great and I'm sure rewarding experience. Now you come back um, mm -hmm. after, your, you know, after your mission, and, you know, what was kind of were you saying, hey, maybe I'll get back into plumbing or, hey, I want to do something else or kind of what was that decision or that or path that uh, pointed your journey towards uh, engineering? Yeah, it was a couple of things. So, you know, I got home from my from my mission in Brazil and 
I started to question, you know, whether I wanted to jump back into the plumbing world. You know, at that time I was, I guess, a second year apprentice, you know, in the apprenticeship program. And I thought, well, I guess Matt, I could get back into it or I could maybe go to college, which to me was kind of a swear word. I was like, Ugh, I don't want to really go to college, but um, I kind of liked to learn how things worked. I, I, at the time I had a four wheeler that I rebuilt. Uh, I love dirt bikes. I love four wheelers. And so at the time I had a four wheeler that I was rebuilding and I had stripped the entire bike down to the frame, the engine had taken the engine apart, uh, rebuilt, put it back together. And I started doing that kind of tinkering with, with some other things, you know, in that three, four month time period that I was home and kind of not really had much to do, you know, you get home and it's like, well, I don't have a job. I'm not going to school yet. So I just kind of tinkered. And I started thinking, you know, what, what is it that I, what I really enjoy doing and then what am I passionate about? And it just kind of seemed natural that I like to learn how things work. And I like to take things apart and see how they, how they work, how they function. And so I was like, well, I guess the only thing I can think of that I, you know, could probably earn a decent living at, have pretty steady income would be like an engineer, maybe a mechanical mm. engineer, but that's way too smart for me. I'd have way too many math classes and science and I probably wouldn't be able to do them. So that was the turning point though for me. So now, so now you decide, okay, you kind of have that turning point, decide to go get the degrees, you go get the degrees in engineering, and then you come out of school. And I think is that, or at that point you decided you'd go work on F-16s for a period of time. So, yeah. Uh, so I started up at Weber State, you know, did their pre-engineering program. At the time, they didn't have an, an ABET accredited engineering program. So I either had to go to the U or had to go to Utah State. I decided to go up to Logan. Hey, you could have uh, gone to BYU, couldn't you? That's also I awesome. I could have gone to BYU. Uh, Gotta give a little plug in for my alma mater. So no. it wasn't really, yeah. I, honestly, I didn't really think about BYU at the time. <laughs> I just, it was either going to be the U or Utah State. I went up to Utah State, go Aggies, and went up there and uh, uh, took, you know, stumbled through. I mean, I guess you could say anybody, any engineering student, I'd say 95% of them just kind of uh, stumble their way through the, the, the material the curriculum and and get through it you know there's five percent or whatever that are natural smarty pants but the rest of us we gotta work through it so that was me graduated hey, i was GPA. right there with you school was not one where it was hey, oh yeah this is a breeze no problem it was always one i had to do a lot of work with so i'm right in the same camp with you yeah so now yeah. Got that. So, uh, once i graduated then yeah hmm. i went out and i was able to get into uh working with the Air Force as a civilian there at Hill Air Force Base, and I was my first assignment was first position was there in the uh, F-16 structural department. That was mm. kind of a cool job. Kind of so like no, and that, that sounds like a cool job just to be able to work on F-16s. I mean, everybody that just sounds like an exciting. Whether or not as exciting as it sounds, it certainly sounds like a pretty exciting job. It was so now, pretty cool. Now, how did you, so you, you did that for a period of time, and I think you worked at Hill. You also um, went and got a master's degree at Purdue. So kind of what made you decide? And then I think you went back to work on F-16. So kind of what was the decision of going back getting the master's and then also um, going back and working on F-16s before you started your own uh, engineering firm? Yeah, so kind of in the back of my mind, I've always had the dream of owning and operating my own engineering firm. And so uh, I had the opportunity when I was working at Hill Air Force Base to work with a, a licensed professional engineer. And, you know, I asked him, hey, you know, would you be OK with me training under you while, you know, while I'm studying and preparing for my professional, my PE exam? And he says, yeah, yeah. And if you pass the exam, yeah, I'll sponsor you. So we kind of had an agreement. I, I saw that as, a, as an opportunity to get licensed, uh, a license, become a licensed professional engineer. and then that would then open the door in my mind for me to be able to practice engineering uh, mm. professionally on a professional level uh, for clients. So it was kind of always there. So now that. you go get the, you know, you go get the, the additional degree, you continue, I think, to work on, uh, you know, F-16s as a, as a civilian for a period of time. Now, yeah. what was the, what was kind of the tipping point? When did you decide, okay, I've got enough experience, I've got enough degrees, I've got enough whatever before or to decide, okay, I'm going to jump in and start doing my own firm or start uh, developing my own stuff? Yeah, so, you know, um, 
I started up Jacobson Engineering the year, the very year that I got licensed, and I just started to try to take on freelance work, uh, try to get some sort, some experience under me, uh, try to give me some some kind of foundation, some credibility, um, and it was like the following year that I got accepted into the DOD Smart Scholarship Program and uh, was afforded the opportunity to move out to West Lafayette and do my, my master's degree out of Purdue, hmm. uh, do my thesis out there. When I came back to the government, however, um, it didn't, the challenges were not the same. I didn't have the same drive, you know. Uh, it was just different coming from grad school in a highly advanced aeronautical field and university coming back to the mundane paper pushing that I was doing that I didn't realize I was doing kind of before, but came back to that and thought, boy, this just isn't doing it for me anymore. So I decided to leave the government and that cost me money because I would have to repay all that. I had a commitment to them. So I had to repay that, but I went and worked for a DOD government uh, contractor where I was actually doing more development work, more research, more um, design work, more integration. I was actually hands-on putting stuff on the jet, new avionics packages and new systems. And I really liked that. It was really fun. I got to learn a ton. And um, yeah, and so I was there for about four and a half years. And at the time I had taken on a really substantial contract with a client that was in itself providing full-time work and I was working full-time with the government, uh, well, with this contractor and I just decided I need to give one of the two up. We were in a good place financially. I just decided to go ahead and make the jump and let's let's try the Jacobson Engineering full-time and see what happens. So that was so, when we, hmm. we decided to do it. Now, one question, when you were working with, you know, the DOD contract and doing a lot of that um, as a contractor, were you still doing Jacobson engineering on the side where you're saying, hey, I already got, I'm already, you know, have way too many things going on. I'll put that on hold or, you know, or what was that what, before you jumped in full or full time on your, your own engineering firm, were you still, or still doing that on the side or was that on hold? No, I was still doing that on the side. You know, I was, I wasn't, I was looking for, I guess you could say the the big contract or the big client that I that would be able to allow me to leave my full time job and and do what I've just been dreaming of for the last you know ten years or whatever and so I finally got that client um, in 2019 toward the end of 2019 and that work carried me all the way into and past summer of 2020 at a full time basis. And then, so I was working that and my full-time uh, DOD job. So I had the two of those I was trying to balance. And I just thought, I've got to, I've got to get rid of one or the other. And I, this has always been my dream. Let's, let's try it out and see how it goes. Hmm. So now you, so, and I, I think that definitely makes sense. So now you, you jump into your own dream. You say, okay, I've always wanted to do my own thing. Can I do my own engineering firm? You know, and I always figure side hustles really are just a second job because you usually spend as much or more time on the side hustle as you do on the, the quote unquote full-time job. But you dive in full-time, say, okay, I'm going to try my own thing. At that point, you know, how did it go? Or do you already have some clients? You had some basis where you, you're saying, hey, I got to hustle. I got to get some more clients. I'm, you know, I got my own projects I want to work on or kind of how did that go as you jumped in full-time? Yeah, so as I jumped in, I had one, one client uh, with, several hot leads, you know, for other clients. And it seemed like things were going to shape up nicely for me. Um, and uh, when I, when I left, you know, I really only had the one, one major client who had a lot of work projected, but ultimately didn't ever pan out. So I left the comfort of my salary job uh, to become, you know, Jacobson engineering full time. And it didn't pan out the way that we were hoping and, and what he was, what they were, what I was being told and promised. And then all of these other hot leads I had just kind of fizzled away. And I was left with a little bit more spare time than I would have liked, hmm. <laughs> which kind so, of leads into Magnatech. 
So that's what I was going to because you, you just kind of answered the question. So, you you know, you, when you get, you know, leads dry up or you're figuring out what you're going to do, you know, you have, you know, and everybody has to make that leap and you always have that client or one, one more client. So you hope that comes along or hope has work. And sometimes it works out and other times you, you have to start to scramble. So as you're facing all that, you could have, you know, you had one path where, hey, I'm going to pursue my own projects. I'm going to do my own thing and start to make a go of the business that way. Or alternatively, you can say, nope, I'm going to, you know, hustle to, you know, whatever it takes to get new clients on board how did you kind of grapple with that decision or how did you you weigh those out um it was kind of a calculated decision you know it was just i we like i said we were in a good place financially uh to take the risk i felt like if if at the very worst case i needed to go back and get a salary job somewhere i could always do that uh, i felt confident that i could do that anyway so mm -hmm. it was just kind of weighing the risks and just saying, you know, it was taking a leap of faith. Like you said, we had the clients or the one client that was uh, providing the majority of the work. Um, and then it was just, let's focus on our marketing to try to find more clients um, and, and hope that it, hope we can find some work. So it was really a leap of faith, honestly. Mm. So now as you're doing, as you're doing your own project, you know, I guess the first question, how did you come up with a project or how did you land on which product or project you wanted to take internal and do your own work on? Are you talking about Mag Magnus Acker? Right. Yeah. That's a good example. Sure. Or if you have any other projects that are worthwhile to discuss, whichever projects you kind of decided, Hey, I've got some good ideas and I'm going to take on, you know, take these on and see where they go. Yeah. So I've had a lot of ideas in the past and really Magnatech was, uh, was the only idea that I really tried to bring to market and um, it's been it's been a lot of fun it's always been a dream of mine too to invent something to get it patented and be able to uh, you know make something useful for our society so it was always that was kind of always a dream of mine as well so yeah like I said just having a little bit of extra uh, spare time on my hands. I was able to, I got myself my first AR back in June of last year mm -hmm. uh, through a brother-in-law. And um, I asked him at the time, you know, what this little accessory mount was. And he told me, you know, this is for accessories. If you want to attach this or that or whatever on there. And I thought, huh, is there any, uh, anything out there right now that's a quick attachment or a magnetic accessory? He's like, no, nothing really that, worth anything and so anyway that's where I had the idea you know let's well, let's see if there's some way we can do this you know what would be some of the criteria that you think would be important for an accessory mount like this and he said you know just being self-zeroing and being strong enough to withstand your recoil and stuff so anyway so I started down that path of wow this is you know the creative juices were flowing and, and I was able to just Things just started coming together really organically. Uh, I really didn't have to battle too much with this particular idea. Uh, it just kind of all seemed to come together, and uh, it was—it's been a lot of fun so far. No, and that, that is fun. And it's always fun when you, you know, you have an idea, you have something that you can latch on to, you start to see it come together, you start to produce it, you start to do everything and it, you know, get some of that traction. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's always fun to have the idea. And then it's fun to see the prototype. And then that first sale, you know, you kind of have those different milestones, all of which are really just fun and exciting. And it kind of keeps building. So now as you kind of, you know, branched out, you started to, or, you know, do Magnatech, you started to, you know, chase after some of your own projects. Now looking kind of into the future a bit, the next six to 12 months, kind of what are the plans? Where do you see things heading? And uh, where, do, you know, what is, uh, what do you hope for in the future? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, in the next six months or so, I'm hoping to continue. I, I do have two, uh, two six month contracts with two different clients in the aerospace industry right now. So I'll continue with those clients um, and I will continue to look for other opportunities to work with clients in any industry, aerospace, uh, automotive, uh, renewable energy. So it doesn't really matter the industry. Every, almost every industry needs mechanical products designed. So um, I'll continue to pursue those types of opportunities through Jacobson Engineering. I'm trying to scale up this business a little bit. Um, mm. trying to bring on more work so that I can spill over and bring on some employees, some engineers. Um, so 
that's the goal with Jacobson Engineering is to scale it up to maybe a two person, two engineer firm, uh, two mm -hmm. or three, you know, just depending. And then uh, with Magnatech is I'd hope to grow that also, that product, um, start scaling that right now. We've produced 250 kits uh, of this magnetic mounting accessory for a particular flashlight that we've, we've procured and we've mm -hmm. sourced and we, we're now uh, selling. So I would say the next goal would be to let's double it. Let's try 500 kits and let's see what happens with that. And just keep going from there. Oh, cool. Sounds like an exciting road ahead. So that's, that's, that's fun. So, well, now as we kind of brought it, <clears throat> brought our, brought everybody up to the, the present and even looked a bit into the future, kind mm -hmm. of uh, that, or hits that point in the, the podcast where I always have two questions at the end of each episode that I ask. So we'll jump to those now. So the first question I'll, I always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made and what did you learn from it? Probably the worst business decision I've made is probably not hiring a business attorney to uh, help me establish or set up my business, you know, uh, with, with me having multiple businesses, I, I took the advice of my accountant and he said, you know, it'll be easier if you set it up this way, maybe easier for him, but it may not be the best <laughs> way business wise. So I would say that that would probably be, uh, one of the mistakes I made is, uh, just relying on my accountants to tell me how to, how to set up a business rather than getting some advice, some legal counsel. So I'd mm. say, so that was what I learned. From now on, if I if you're gonna set up a business, make sure you just spend an hour or two with a business attorney and just make sure you're doing it right. No, and I think that's always great advice in the sense that you know, with the, the kind of to follow on with that, a lot of times as an entrepreneur, as you know, as, as somebody that's doing a startup, small business, you're always looking to one, you know, save save money because there's always more things to spend money on than money to spend. And two, you're always saying, oh, a lot of times I could probably do this myself. And so kind of when you get into that mode, sometimes you're right. Sometimes you can save money in some areas. Sometimes you can do things yourself, but there are also areas where you're saying, hey, I need the expertise. I know something, need someone that knows what they're doing, how to do it, make sure it's done right. Because usually if you don't, if you cut corners in that area, it's usually more expensive and time or, or time and more time and effort to fix it than just get it done right if it is able to be done so i think yeah. that figuring out what areas you need expertise on who can help you in those areas is a worthwhile thing but it's an easy mistake to, to certainly make yeah second question i always ask is if you're talking now someone to someone that's just getting to a startup just getting into a small business what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them um just probably to constantly believe in yourself believe in your product if you feel like your product is if you feel that you, your product has value, you'll have a lot of people that will dismiss it or say that's really cool, but you know that's as far as it goes. And you'll have a lot of days where you're thinking, maybe this was a mistake, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And you'll have a lot of times where you're doubtful, but I would say just continue to keep the faith, keep holding on to your belief that you've come up with something uh, valuable and that just, keep pushing forward and having faith it'll work out mm. no and i think that you know one of the things that differentiate between everybody you know there's a lot of people that are the idea you know idea guys or idea people that they have great ideas and they, you know, they think that, you know, oh, I have, you know, ideas all the time. And I'm, if I ever chase them, I'd be a millionaire type of thing. And those people are yeah. much different than the people that actually execute. They actually do something, they follow through, they continue on it, they stick to it. And those are ones I are oftentimes successful. You know, ideas is the old yeah. cliche goes or a dime a dozen. It's that execution. It's the follow through on the ideas that makes a difference between somebody that's always has that idea that never does anything with it and someone that builds a business around it. I couldn't agree a hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more, Devin. It's, 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 it is so true. And I've had a lot of ideas in my lifetime as well, but like I said, this was the only one that I felt like Magnatech was the only one that I felt like, uh, I, well, it was just a combination of things, just time and resources. And it was just a lot of things combined that just said, this is a good time to do it. Let's do it. Uh, it just felt right. 
So no. No, I and I, I definitely think that may, I think it's a great advice. So as we, now as we wrap up, if people want to find out more about Magnatech, they want us to look at the, uh, you know, the quick connect accessories for the AR-15, other things you guys are producing, or they want to reach out in your engineering firm and they want to hire you for a, a contract basis or they're worth the DOD. They want to be a customer, a client. They want to be an investor. They want to be an employee. They want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above. What's the best way to reach out, find out more? Yeah, probably the best way is to just go to our website, um, jacobsonengineeringservices.com is my website, and uh, magnatech.com, and uh, magnatech is spelled with a hyphen between magni and hyphen tech. Oh, I don't know if the podcast is going to have any video feed. Is it? <laughs> it will have video. So magna is right there on the hat. So Yeah, it's right here on the hat. <laughs> if you're watching on the video side, then uh, go ahead and uh, you can just uh, grab it there. If not, it's uh, M A M A G N E dash T E C H dot com, right? Yep, yep, that's it. So I would say go there. Uh, we have there's contact us on both websites. Just just hit that, uh, fill out your information. It'll send an email right to me. So. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage everybody to reach out, find out more, support the support the business, support the startup, and uh, and hire uh, hire Joel for all of uh, your your engineering needs. Or so connect as, with me on LinkedIn. All right, LinkedIn or connect him on LinkedIn as well. So, well, as we wrap up for the the uh, for the podcast, um, appreciate you coming on, Joel, being a guest on the podcast. So it's been a fun and it's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell, we'd love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Feel free to go to inventiveguest.com. Apply to be on the show. Two more things as a listener. One, make sure to click subscribe in your podcast player so you know when all of our awesome episodes come out. And two, leave us a review so new people can find out about all of our awesome episodes. Last but not least, if you ever need help with patents, trademarks, or anything else, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. Thanks again, Joel. It's been a fun, it's been a pleasure, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thanks, Devin.